So good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all very, very much for coming to this very special Grand Rounds, which is our annual Jack H. Mendelssohn Memorial Award celebration. I'm really happy to see all of you here. This is um, a great this is a great Grand Rounds um, tr tribute to the memory of uh, Dr. Mendelssohn, and it's always a very special time for us as a community as we think about him. Today we're going to celebrate the legacy of Jack Mendelssohn and the achievements of Dr. Bertha Madras. I just want to say on a personal note, um, I think my, um, my, uh, I first I first got to know uh, Dr. Mendelssohn in the early 1980s when I was a, a medical student, and I was first inspired by him when I heard a, his lecture on the genetics of alcoholism. I think I was a second year medical student. Um, I then worked with him as a resident in psychiatry here at McLean, and then he was a major mentor and also supporter of my own research career, career when I was a new faculty member at McLean. I was just reminiscing a little bit with Dr. Madras in saying that he was a very generative person and he was very interested in um, facilitating the careers of junior investigators as long, even if they were not completely aligned with his own science, but as long as they were pursuing questions with rigor um, in the area of addiction and substance use disorders. He was an incredibly supportive person, and I, every time I ever went into his office, I never failed to leave without like a stack of articles about this thick um, of all the things that he had just recently been involved in and published, and, um, and they were always just like exceptional. So it, it was an amazing experience to actually um, have uh, him um, as an anchor, I'd say, in my own um, career. He really was a dedicated and well-respected researcher and mentor. He was clearly a pioneer in the investigation of the biological and behavioral aspects of substance use disorders and was among the first to bring multidisciplinary collaboration of modern technology and organized research administration to this field. Jack was both brilliant and strategic. And um, he built the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Research Center, or ADARC, into a landmark, internationally recognized center of research in this field, and made seminal discoveries in medications such as buprenorphine and sex differences in alcohol, cocaine, and substances. His findings not only revolutionized scientific understanding of substance use behavior, it stimulated a new generation of behavioral and biological researchers. And through this prestigious award, we are able to recognize Dr. Mendelssohn's invaluable legacy to addiction research and to McLean. And it's a great honor to present the award annually to someone who builds on the efforts of pioneers like him. And, um, I'd like at this time to invite Dr. Roger Weiss, the chief of our division of alcohol and drug abuse to the podium to in introduce this year's um, exceptionally well-deserving recipient of this award, Dr. Bertha Madras. Thanks, Shelley. So one of the, one of the um, hallmarks of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Research Center that Dr. Mendelssohn started was its multidisciplinary um, approach and they had um, psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, imaging researchers, endocrinologists, you name it. Um, and in thinking about um, uh, our, our recipient this year, Dr. Bertha Madras, she's just the perfect uh, awardee for this. Do we usually talk in terms of um, sort of bench to bedside research, but we've got with Dr. Madras bench to White House uh, research. And um, it sort of goes beyond the bedside. And so um, Dr. Um, Madras really started out her career and made her name as a basic researcher. Um, she's a professor of psychobiology at Harvard Medical School uh, and directs the Laboratory of Addiction Neurobiology here at McLean. She's, um, her laboratory research has focused on neurobiology, brain imaging, and medications development. She has over 200 scientific publications and 19 U.S. and 27 international patents. Um, she developed the first course on addiction for at Harvard Medical School, and I remember uh, teaching in that course many years ago. Um, 
And she sort of moved beyond that from uh, that type of research to education with a, a science, uh, public education with a, an exhibit at the um, Museum of Science on drugs and the brain, and then sort of got to a bigger platform. And from 2006 to 2008, she was the deputy director for demand reduction in the White House Office of uh, National Drug Control Policy and the Executive Office of the President. Um, and then she continued moving up, on up, was invited to the Vatican for a prestigious conference on um, addiction. And then in 2017, she was appointed by President Trump to a six-member presidential commission on combating drug addiction and the opioid crisis. As the only scientist, she then got um, uh, asked, demanded um, to write these up. This was a gigantic um, effort um, and really a terrific uh, report on the opioid crisis. Uh, last year, she became a member of the National Academy of Medicine Collaborative for the, on the opioid crisis. She's received many awards, including an NIH Merit Award, um, NIDA Public Service Award, American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry Founders Award, et cetera. So I think that's pretty clear that Dr. Madras is deserving of this award, and I'm very pleased to introduce her. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Closeness, be it with your family, friends, or colleagues, can result in a surfeit of over-familiarity, perceptions, and critiques. For this reason, there's no greater joy that can arise if one is commended by those closest to you, be it the love and loyalty from family, from my beloved husband who's sitting here, from my children and grandchildren, or appreciation by peers with whom you work with on a daily basis. So it's an especial honor to be the recipient of this reward from my peers, and particularly one named after Jack Mendelssohn. Jack endures, his memory endures, not only for his excellent scientific accomplishments, for his mentorship, but for his bottomless storehouse of humor. He enlivened our routine lives and delivered welcome respite from the grave problems we collectively work to solve. I thank my outstanding and cherished colleagues. You welcome me here to McLean despite all the strikes against me. I'm a centenarian. I harbor an unhealthy body metabolic index. I have limited resources, and yet you created a home for me. You accepted me with generosity of time, of spirit, encouragement, with insights and the wisdom that you've helped me forge this phase of my glorious years at McLean. I thank Dr. Scott Rausch, Shelley Greenfield, Roger Weiss, Carrie Ressler, Jack Bergman, Bill Carlison, the wonderful Sabina Beretta and Suzanne Haber, Bruce Cohn, Dost Unger, and also Scott Lucas. Is Scott here? Well, Scott is the originator of my most embarrassing moment in staid Washington, so please ask him why he was the source of this embarrassment when you see him. I also thank Mark Kaufman, who's here, and so many unnamed others. McLean is a uniquely extraordinary community woven together by a single vision to understand the brain and to heal the brain and to treat brain disorders. It has accomplished so much with an outstanding family of clinicians, scientists, and hybrids of the two. For all of us, it is a privilege to work in the number one psychiatric hospital in the, in the world. Our mission is the brain, a three-pound organ that we revere because it is the repository of our humanity. It is the repository of our wisdom, our ability to love, to learn, to create, to compute, to compose, to contemplate, to think, to remember, to feel empathy, to engage in justice and compassion, but only when it functions well. 
and our mission is when it functions imperfectly to heal it or to understand why. When it is functioning imperfectly, it can engender immense uncertainty, suffering, and acts that are contrary to habit. No other field can bring more profound and blessed relief when scientific progress combined with compassionate care improves a life, sometimes incrementally, at other times dramatically. You, my colleagues, daily engage in this exalting mission and this remarkable home, McLean Hospital. Now, closer to the topic at hand, this is a, a, a history of life which I begin by expressing deep gratitude to all the mentors, collaborators, colleagues. I point out Jack Bergman, Roger Spielman, and um, Peter Dews and John Neumeyer, who were instrumental in helping me get started at Harvard many, many years ago, 33 years ago. I also have deep gratitude to the McLean family, to the people who've helped me enormously here, both in the clinical domain as well as in the basic science domain. Each one of you pictured here is a very important component of my life. An odyssey in three parts, public education, which I'll dwell upon very minimally, some research, and then public policy and service. These are from um, the web of science, a breakdown of the publications in terms of the areas in which I have published. And you can see they vary quite widely from neurosciences to organic chemistry to medicinal chemistry and so on, psychiatry. And let, let me just begin by focusing on public education for one moment. It is critical that we as scientists, we as, uh, and those of you who are clinicians, to translate what you do to the public. There is no point in having so many of discoveries in a domain which affects the lives of so many in so many fundamental ways lie fallow gathering electronic dust and servers and not explaining what we do and why we do it and how it can impact our lives. And so this is a push to, to advocate for public education. My career began as an undergraduate in the Honors Biochemistry program at McGill University. I was born in Montreal and this is not winter by Montreal standards. This, in fact, is early summer. <laughs> um, a paper that I, I wrote on phenylketonuria hooked me for life on neuroscience. And the reason it did is that I realized by understanding some of the biochemistry of the brain and body, one can alter and change the course of a child's lifetime. What is so interesting is that I wrote this paper and admired so deeply a person who had gone from state to state trying to advocate testing for this genetic disease in, in, in newborns in order to put them on a phenylalanine-free diet and prevent them from developing the very adverse consequences of phenylketonuria. Fast forward about 45 years later, I served on the promotions committee at Harvard, and his name came up for promotion as a professor. And I actually wept when I saw it, thinking that this was the inspiration for my career. And yet he was in his 70s, and through modesty and other reasons, had never had the accolades that he deserved from this institution. Of course, he was promoted. So let's talk a bit about translational research, basic neuroscience, and public health policy research that I've engaged in. Translational research can be thought of, perceived of, as starting with cells in vitro in the test tube, moving from rodents to primates, and finally to humans. 
My first exposure to translational research was after I finished a graduate degree. I decided to get training in fundamental biochemistry, below the neck biochemistry, because I felt at that time dopamine had just been discovered, serotonin was just being discovered, and I felt that most of the frontiers and techniques and technologies were occurring below the neck in basic biology. And so I applied to be mentored as a postdoc by Al Meister, who had just written two volumes on the biochemistry of amino acids, and I felt that he could teach me a lot of techniques that would be useful later on. And he told me to go through his lab the first day I arrived and speak to everyone in his lab, his graduate students, postdocs, and just latch on to a project they were doing. And to be quite honest and frank, I found a lot of their work uninspiring because it was very, very basic biochemistry. How many magnesium uh, molecules, ions are needed for an enzyme to work and so on. And so I came to him at four in the afternoon that day and I said, Al, because he wanted to be on first name basis unlike the formality of Canada, I said, there's nothing here that I really I'm inspired by. He said, okay, you take my two volumes of the biochemistry of amino acids and you go home tonight and read them. And I want you by tomorrow morning to come up with a project. And so I literally, we had just moved to Boston. I was sitting on the floor leaning against a wall and I was really skimming two volumes in one night. The next morning at nine o'clock, I said, there's a very interesting enzyme called asparagine synthetase that is supposed to make asparagine from aspartate. Aspartate is not an essential amino acid. We can make it, but nobody has found it in mammalian tissue. And he said, okay, you're on. I said, I'd like to develop an assay for it and see if we can work. And within no time at all, I worked, I, the assay was up and running within a few weeks, but I looked in every, round up the usual suspects in normal tissue and I couldn't detect it. And I was so deeply unhappy with that course of events that I went into his office and I said, Al, it's gotta be there. It has to be, we don't need to consume asparagine from our diet. I said, maybe in tumor tissue because it grows so quickly, I'll be able to find it. And he said, fine. He called Charles River Lab and they had Novikov hepatuma uh, rats, rats that were harboring this tumor. And I said, I've got to find this in, a, in, 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 the tumor, in, the, in the tumors. We did, we found it. And then I said, he said, where do we go now? I said, I'll bet the tumors that have the enzyme are resistant to asparaginase that kills certain tumors. And I said, tumors that don't have the enzyme will die. And then he became chairman at Cornell. Bernie Horowitz took over the project and we reported exactly these hypotheses that asparagine sensitive leukemias were those that had very low levels of this enzyme and the resistant ones had very high levels. And now it's standard of care for chemotherapy. And I thought this is so exciting because we can actually make a difference, at least at a fundamental biochemical level. We certainly weren't involved in clinical chemotherapy, but we began to explain why this asparaginase chemo can suppress tumors. Fast forward many, many years and began to work on monoamine transporters. Monoamine transporters regulate monoamines in brain they transport monoamines into, into vesicles. They're critical. 
They regulate dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. Others regulate glutamate and so many other transmitters. They affect behavior, attention, mood. Many medications are targeted to these transporters, including those for narcolepsy, depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, and they're also the targets for stimulants. There are certain disorders that express rare coding variants of the dopamine transporter, including in ADHD and bipolar and autism. So this is a very interesting group of, uh, of, um, of molecules of proteins. Then we go into translational work. And I'll give you only a few examples of using translational research related to these transporters. MDMA ecstasy is a very potent psychoactive substance that's both a euphoriant and a pathogen as well as a stimulant. And what we found is that contrary to all the opinions that exist in the literature that said it works primarily through serotonin, that the norepinephrine transporter was really a very important target for MDMA. It released norepinephrine almost uh, more effectively than it, than it was able to release serotonin. And in all these domains, it won. So what we concluded is that maybe this transporter is important in the behavioral and the, um, the, the psychoactive properties in humans. So first we started with primates and we noticed that when we give MDMA to primates the first day, they don't function at all. And as time goes on, they recover within the second day and so on. But if you, try to, if you try to block the effects of MDMA with a dopamine transport blocker, it has no effect whatsoever. If you try to block it with a serotonin transport blocker, it has profound alleviating effects on their performance. And with the norepinephrine transport inhibitor, we predicted, as we predicted, it would also block. So we said perhaps this is an interesting way to alleviate some of the psychoactive and blood pressure effects and so on of MDMA. And then a group in Europe listened to this study and others as well and noticed that if they gave MDMA it had a good drug effect, but if they if they provided subjects with a norepinephrine transporter, it dampened the good effect. And the same was true for stimulation, it dampened it. And the same was true for a drug high. With MDMA, there was a high, and with a norepinephrine transport blocker, it attenuated it. This is a very clean example of starting in the test tube, working through primates, and then working into humans. So they could, the norepinephrine transport inhibitors may contribute to alleviating the effects of um, MDMA. Then we get to another example of translational research, and that's brain imaging. The goose that laid the golden egg was this compound called WIN35428, otherwise designated CFT, that we were trying to desperately, I was desperately trying to find a way to look at cocaine targets in the brain with a clean, uh, a clean probe. And when I saw this data, I said to Michelle Fahey, who was my one and only technician and my one and only co co cohort in the lab, that the affinity is high, the dissociation is so, the non-selective binding was outstanding. And the day that she showed me the data that was generated, I said, Michelle, this is going to be a brain imaging agent for the dopamine transporter and for dopamine neurons. This is an extraordinary one. Uh, I said, I've never seen such clean data because I'd looked at receptors and so on. I had not seen this level of what we call nonspecific binding. 
and I thank Jack Bergman and Roger Spielman for the support they provided. Very soon, I had more collaborators than I could dream of. Chemist Peter Meltzer, Alan Jones, and Alan Davison. Alan Jones and Alan Davison from Brigham and from MIT were the ones who had developed a technetium generator kit which could be used on a lab bench to generate brain imaging probes for PET. They had developed it for heart, uh, heart studies and Cardiolite now, I don't like to talk money, but it's a $2 billion a year industry. And they approached me, Alan and Alan, and they said, let's do one for the brain. And so we developed um, with a number of people um, a technetium probe, and a technetium is a Mack truck that you have to pull with a tiny little molecule. This is huge compared to this, it's not in scale. And we showed that in SPECT imaging, the technetium was very selective for the dopamine transporter. But at this point, I began to get weary of all the um, development of newer probes. And I said, let's start to apply them to human conditions. Mark Hoffman, who's sitting here, did the autoradiography here. Um, showing that in Parkinson's disease, the CFT, the first probe that we developed, detected Parkinson's disease with tremendous selectivity and specificity in both the caudate and putamen with no overlap. And then with the secondary, a, a new generation, which can be used for PET and SPECT, uh, Alan Fishman and myself and David Emola at the Mass General uh, Ali Bonab, we, um, we examined this probe in Parkinson's disease tissue and found that in living brain there was a tremendous, um, a, a tremendous uh, specificity for Parkinson's. And the show was over within, a, within one hour. It could be used for multiple applications. So then we moved on. Other people jumped on the bandwagon. Right now, there is a development of at least, at least 25 different variants of CFT on the market. Uh, not on the market, but in, in uh, research as well. And um, one of them, some of them have worked very well. A number of them take a long time to develop images because they are not selective and they have to clear other brain areas. But at the, uh, one of them, which was um, ushered in by uh, John Neumeier, DATSCAN, was approved by the FDA. On to more applications. A presentation at the MGH on ADHD uh, fired up uh, enthusiasm with uh, Tom Spencer to study ADHD with, to see whether or not, because the Dopamine transport is the target of ADHD drugs to see whether or not these drugs, whether or not the transporter was anomalous. And we found that there was increases in transport in the right and left caudate particularly. Others have replicated it, but not all. We think the results are probe dependent and morphology of the striatum may be a factor. But we went a little bit further. Greg Miller in my group, we were discussing the fact that the dopamine transporter has a uh, untranslated region in the uh, three prime in the three prime area of the dopamine transporter gene, and it has variable number of repeat sequences in it. Nine, ten, some have six, some have twelve. Depends on the individual. And I said to Greg, let's see if these repeats will affect how many transporters are actually produced. This is the so-called junk DNA the, that no longer is considered junk, but is considered critical in terms of regulating uh, one of the main regulators of how much protein is made. And so we used two different promoters and find, found that the nine repeat sequence always increased the dopamine transporter. This was done in 2002. 
And fast forward to 2014, and um, Steve Ferrone and Tom Spencer, and we all collaborated on doing a meta-analysis showing that the nine repeat allele in the gene is associated with higher transporter density in the brain. Why is this important? Because this transporter regulates dopamine, which is so critical for so much normal activity, as well as pathophysiological processes. And knowing that a genetic variant can influence tr dramatically how much uh, transporter is present, how much dopamine may be released, sequestered, and so on, uh, turns out to be a, 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 a very, inter and very interesting advance. So in vitro, again, we start with the test tube. The nine repeat was associated with more transporter. PET imaging showed that in living brain, there's more dopamine transporter associated with the nine repeat. The non-coding region obviously influences expression. And this variable a number tandem repeat sequence is associated with a number of neuropsychiatric diseases. Application number five, modafinil is a well-aged anti-narcoleptic drug that has been known for years. For years and years, there was controversy in the literature as to its mechanism of action. And I looked at the literature. Everyone said it doesn't work on the transporter. It's says there's something wrong because somehow it doesn't, ha it doesn't ha affect amphetamine the way it should. And I won't go into all the details on the controversy, but I looked and said, it's got to work through the transporter. And so I called Alan Fishman. I said, Alan, let's do this in primates. Let's see if modafinil will occupy the transporter. And it sure did. At therapeutic doses, it was very potent. One of the reasons that people said it's not possible is that its affinity is about a micromolar for the transporter. And most of these drugs that work on the transporter are 1 to 30 nanomolar, but a thousand, uh, uh, but a hundredfold less, po uh, more potent. And so they said it's never going to get there. And of course it did. Then I spoke to Nora Volko. I said, Nora, I've got to share this news. Why don't you try it in human? And she did and found exactly the same data in human. And then we realized that it has its mechanism of action must involve the dopamine transporter. And we also did norepi imaging in primate. And then we moved on to human. We did it in human as well in 2010. And now six US studies are showing superiority of modafinil in cocaine abstinence. And in some ways, just showing that it works at the same target as cocaine catalyzed this interest in it. <coughs> Then uh, Tom Spencer was interested in seeing whether or not we can use imaging to, um, to develop a method of predicting abuse liability of different formulations of psychostimulant drugs that have abuse liability. And so we did, uh, with Alan and Ali and, and Tom, um, we compared the slow-release methylphenidate with immediate release and found that the slow-release methylphenidate, the immediate release, spiked very quickly and fell very quickly, which is the same type of kinetics as cocaine has. But this slow-release formulation increased quickly, but it remained on the transporter for a much longer period of time. And when the subjects were asked, how do you feel? This immediate release subject said, I can really feel an effect much more robustly. And they also said they like the effect if you inject a rapid release. And so here's another example of using this very simplistic method. It's actually not simplistic. The number of times that the robot broke down, the chemist was unable to make it or the physicist was unable to analyze 
There were many aborted studies, but we ended up doing a great deal of research using these applications. So two different formulations have different onset offset times, and DAT imaging pharmacokinetics can predict the abuse liability of methylphenidate formulations, and then we apply this to a new psychoactive substance class called alpha PVP or FLACA, which is on the market, uh, which has killed uh, well over 100 people in Europe and uh, has been scheduled. And what we found remarkably is that the affinity of this series of drugs does not correlate with debt occupancy, but how lipophilic they are does. And so we introduced this concept of using DAD imaging to develop a, a, what I would consider a very efficient way of gauging abuse liability in, uh, in primate brain. And then we went on to one final application, which was, can we use this technique of imaging the transporter to deliver things directly into specific dopamine neurons. This compound is very selective for the dopamine transporter. This is not so much, it can hit serotonin as well, but we coupled a nucleoside, inosine, to these compounds using various chemical techniques, but also with um, a hydrolyzable group, an ester link that can be hydrolyzed very easily. And we show that their affinity when we couple them is very high. And we also began to see the beginnings of delivery into the brain, part, primarily into dopamine neurons, primarily two dopamine neurons, we haven't done the in vitro work yet, of compounds. And what we're thinking about is using this methodology to deliver silencing RNA or other short oligonucleotides into specifically into dopamine neurons to silence proteins that are either over or underexpressed um, in pa pathological states. And we show the feasibility of coupling. So with decades and decades of growth, Every year, there are more and more imaging um, studies being done with this class of compounds called uh, phenyltropanes, phenyltropane analogs, which were started in March 1st, 1989. And right now, there are over 1,900 papers using a whole range of, um, using it to apply to a whole range of motor diseases, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, and pharmacology treatment. There is no time to get into any of our basic neuroscience of primate to human genotyping and phenotyping, to drug discovery and structure activity, to non-amines, to a real cocaine antagonist that worked beautifully in vitro but not in vivo and to trace amines in the brain, which are a very interesting group because there's a phase two antipsychotic now on the market, a phase two uh, study of an antipsychotic drug that is um, a trace amine and 5-HT1A receptor targeted. Policy research, we can go through this rapidly. We, have, we reported the first report of the federal screening brief intervention referral to treatment uh, effectiveness of this set of algorithms in uh, physicians' offices and in hospital emergency rooms on reducing uh, substance use disorders at, at, compared with, um, at, at six months compared to intake. These, um, these data were gleaned from the uh, uh, SAMHSA data uh, website with an N of over 450,000 people. And we also found positive changes in, in social functioning and functional domains. More recently, this is going to be published in 2019. Paul Larkin and I have c uh, c 
collaborated on, on a, a very lengthy uh, review of whether or not marijuana is a th an effective therapeutic response to the opioid epidemic. And this past year, we collaborated with Bob DuPont and a group at SAMHSA on showing that children who don't use marijuana are much less likely to use other drugs, including cigarettes and alcohol and, and illicit drugs. But if they use marijuana, the likelihood is there's a far higher association. Um, another one that we're doing now, which is not, um, which is in preparation, which uh, is still embargoed because uh, it has to have government clearance. And I'm collaborating again this time with uh, SAMHSA, the CDC, and NIDA. Does parents' marijuana use influence offspring opioid abuse? And this multivariable model is being controlled for age and income and past year major depressive marijuana use of the peers, youth perceived risks, and so on. And I won't give you the data except it's because it has to be cleared, but it's actually quite interesting and very important. So what about our current research? We're currently worried and concerned about the increasing reports from at least three or four longitudinal studies on the influence of marijuana on the development of psychosis or preclinical psychosis in young people. This was a study by Bechtold. It was published in the American Journal and that found a, as a duration of time of uh, use in terms of this is weekly use if used for one to two years or three years or four, there is an increased um, dose response and effect, um, self-reporting of bizarre thoughts, paranoia, hallucinations, and subclinical psychosis. And so we thought about this and said, well, aberrant preclinical cortical dopamine circuits are implicated in psychosis. And we began to look at some of the issues involved, including the fact that marijuana is a very complex, uh, complex uh, substance that has approximately 104 cannabinoids in it. The two most prominent ones are THC and cannabidiol, or CBD, and they differ markedly in terms of their um, pharmacological and behavioral effects. THC is addictive, intoxicating, and impairs cognition. It promotes anxiety. It's psychotomimetic. It, can, it is associated with long-term production of psychosis. It may be an anti-seizure or pro-seizure, uh, substance and it binds to um, CB1 and CB2 receptors. Cannabidiol does none of these and in some cases may even antagonize them. And what's happened in the market now is that the ratio of THC to CBD has risen up to 80 to 1 in many, in many samples compared to uh, 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 compared to CBD. There are still places where you can get a 1 to 1 ratio or a 10 to 1, but right now it's 80 to 1. And we began to worry, and we st I started this wonderful collaboration with my dear colleague Jack Bergman, with Sarah Withy, who was working diligently on the project, to compare adolescent primates' response with adult response to THC or CBD. These are behavioral approaches. And in acquisition of a learning task on a computerized screen, the animals um, are clearly in the first phase of learning. There's a difference between a, a vehicle and those who are treated with THC or THC plus CBD. CBD does not stand out as either improving or exacerbating the symptoms. I really thank uh, Sabina and Carrie Ressler's lab and Bill Carlison's for helping us in the in vitro uh, models there. Sabina has been extraordinary and so has the other two. Now what we have, which is so interesting, is that in 2006, we started this project in 2002, 
In 2006, we published that dopamine agonists will regulate DCC. What is DCC? It will regulate the mRNA expression. It will regulate the protein expression. And DCC is a transmembrane domain protein that's a receptor that is critically involved in driving adolescent prefrontal cortex maturation. It guides dopamine circuits to their final destination. And it coordinates neuronal development throughout life. It's also been implicated in a number of, um, in a number of genetic studies in schizophrenia and in depression and in bipolar. And if DCC is low, there's more innervation of dopamine. These are preclinical rodents and mice. There's more dopamine, there's more synapses, there's less nucleus accumbens innervation. Mice perform better, they have more cognitive flexibility, more impulse control. In humans, mutations in DCC give rise to developmental split brain. Now, if there's less, if there's high DCC, there's less innervation of the prefrontal cortex. Mice manifest behavioral anomalies, a depression phenotype, and in humans, there is increased DCC in the prefrontal cortex in humans that have died with severe depression, a 50% increase. And haloperidol downregulates DCC in the ventral tegmental area. Well, we put all of this together. Dopamine circuit formation, our early studies showing that dopamine agonists regulate DCC. And we found in, this is a, a collaboration with Jack Bergman, we found that THC upregulates DCC in the frontal cortex. And if you combine it with, these are 24-day treatment in vivo, combined with cannabidiol, there's a downregulation. There's also an upregulation with regard to D1, D2 dopamine receptor heteromers, a vast increase of them. And I can't get into it because of time, what the implications is. But cannabidiol attenuated this upregulation it attenuated a whole list of biochemical sequela in, in um, signaling um, pathways of the dopamine receptors. And this is Susan George's lab is working with us on this. So the implications is, is it time to regulate THC levels and this ratio in marijuana that's available? in states that have legalized or legitimized its use. Public policy, I will briefly deal with this. There are three areas that are worth reporting on. One is the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, the um, service in the White House Office of National Drug Policy. A phone call came, a cold call one day, completely unanticipated. Would you willing to be, serve as deputy director? Begins with a cake, a swearing-in ceremony, a lot of, uh, this is Jim Wortham from the Primate Center, Michelle Fahey who showed up, um, the RCMP who I had trained their officers on the biology of addiction, so they showed up. But it ends with a cake and in between, <laughs> In between, we had an enormous amount of, um, of euphoria in terms of what was accomplished during that time and dysphoria in terms of what was not. The Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which occurred um, last year, I just urge you to go into their website and read the final report. There were 20 people on the uh, panel uh, there were six Americans, and um, Marcello Serrando, who's the chancellor of the academy, and I essentially edited the final statement and went back and forth via email instantly to tweak all the language, um, including what the Pope had desired to be put in. And it's a very interesting document that's worth reading. The place was beautiful. 
except for the food. <laughs> um, and now we'll just finish with this state of the opioid crisis, the root causes, the commission, and what should psychiatry do? I think that's, this is probably the most important segment of what we do. The mortality rates from unintentional drug overdoses have skyrocketed in recent years, with fentanyl now holding the lion's share of the deaths, followed by heroin. What are the root causes? Um, Sir Angus Deaton, the Nobel laureate in economics, and I have had a wonderful debate on this. On, um, he feels that it's economic despair, and I have pointed out uh, reasons why I don't think it is. Um, we can, we've done our dialogue at least twice, and it's fascinating, another time, another place. Um, there are many, many hypotheses. The one that I subscribe to is a very vast increase in supply, first of prescription opioids and then of heroin and fentanyl. In the 19th century, we had a terrible opioid epidemic in our country with women mostly affected. And what nobody realizes is that in our austere, um, New, it's not, a, uh, not a steer. In our eminent New England Journal of Medicine in 1825, there were people already publishing ways of surmounting over opioid overdoses, either using um, essentially acetic acid or vinegar to promote vomiting or using a tube to extract the opioid from the stomach. We had a terrible period of generational forgetting where addiction and overdose and non-effectiveness of opioids for chronic pain were completely ignored. And then came, and it was triggered by this, again, in our um, excellent New England Journal of Medicine, a five-sentence letter to the editor saying addiction is rare and patients treated with narcotics. The pressure for pain managed with, with opioids increased dramatically. Pharmaceutical companies spent millions of dollars educating patients and clinicians. The VA adopted pain as a, a fifth vital sign, and the pressure was on to physicians to prescribe opioids. And we became a nation awash with them. We are the highest prescribing country of all the 31 highest prescribing countries in the world. We prescribe on average five times more. The cartels in Mexico took note and they began to produce much more pure heroin and to lower the price of it. And it changed the landscape with more and more people initiating opioids with heroin rather than with prescription opioids and treatment. With the advent of fentanyl, which is lethal at this dose, we had a perfect storm in our country, which rages to this day. And so President Trump decided to tackle it. This is the cabinet room, and I'm way, way down there, which doesn't matter at all but he organized this commission with three governors, with Congressman Patrick Kennedy, Attorney General Pam Bondi, Charlie Baker, Governor of Massachusetts, Roy Cooper, Chris Christie, and we were tasked with finding where is federal money going, how can we prevent, how can we treat, how, can, how, how effective are educational messages, and what about the federal government? Are the programs effective and prevent and, and to present it to the president? If you look at where to begin, there are so many facets. And this is a, a screenshot of one of my pages. By July 2017, I had outlined 250 topics for the final commission report. This is simply fentanyl. I, uh, sorry, this is simply. Um, I can't even remember, um, <laughs> fentanyl, uh, uh, bup buprenorphine and fentanyl, uh, uh, naloxone availability. There are many, there are, I don't know how many pages just of the outline. And Governor Christie, um, 
He endeared himself to me for life by calling me up after I sent him these pages and pages of what the report should contain. And he said, hey kid, now if you're 18 and you're called a kid, you're offended. If you're 100 years old and you're called a kid, you're flattered. And he flattered me with that. Um, we made, we finally generated from 250 topics, 56 recommendations, which included all these areas. And I'm deeply grateful to Roger Weiss, to Shelley Greenfield and Hillary Connery for literally being an indispensable help in terms of shaping um, the reality of treatment of, of, um, of uh, opioid use disorder. They were just wonderful. Um, they are to be commended. And these were the topics that were included. The report came out. One of the things that I did was find out how we got into this mess in the first place. And in order to reverse engineer with recommendations, what were the problems that, we, that led to this? And these were some of them that we identified. We identifi identified over 26 that needed reverse engineering. And then our observations, we need to improve transitions in patients from opioids to safer alternatives, from opioid use disorder to treatment, from rescue to treatment, treatment to long-term recovery. The role of psychiatry is enormous in this. Improved psychiatric training in substance abuse. Dr. Greenfield in 2009 developed a wonderful a substance use training program for psychiatry residents that should be must reading for educators, improved training and pain management. Psychiatrists are wonderful motivators for the untreated. They need to engage and help others figure out how to motivate because 70% of our population does not receive treatment. Comorbidity is a very, very critical component of this, and we need to treat comorbid mental illness and substance use disorders, and yet, and psychiatrists are best at this. We need, psychiatrists should be prescribing opioid use disorders. They should be pre presenting themselves as role models for treating chronicity and detect and provide help for children at risk. The commission report was issued November 2017. The bipartisan legislation was signed in October 2018. And so I conclude with the joyful life of research, the pure joy of just discovery, the pure joy of adding to knowledge, the pure joy of improving life, the pure joy of collaborations, of friendships, of experiences. And yes, this looks like one is resting, but fennel kitchen Yura keeps drawing me back. And I always quote Ulysses, which we began with, from Alfred Lord Tennyson. And though we are not now the strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are, one equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. I am deeply grateful to my lab colleagues. I'm deeply grateful to my wonderful family. Thank you, and make sure that you have dopamine for dinner. <laughs> Thank you.